picking up from the sense that I got during the last two sessions, I want to also begin by mentioning that labor jurisprudence in India is considered to be something which was highly developed. Very few countries in the world have had the type of labor jurisprudence that India has had. And there's no doubt that the single most important reason for that has been the struggle of the trade unions. No case goes up to the Supreme Court unless there's a trade union to follow it up. It may take a decade or two before an important decision is obtained from the Supreme Court. But it's not only the judiciary, it's also the type of uh, labor legislation framework which India had. Uh, that's already been referred to in the previous session uh, and I completely agree with that uh, perception that what we have enjoyed as labor jurisprudence is certainly the product of, uh, of post-independent uh, Indian economic development and the model that was adopted for the same. So it's the social democratic model, if you like the Fabian social democratic model and so the framework of labor legislation uh, in India is not accidental. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, introduced in very definite, planned manner. And it's gone through quite an elaborate process of conceptualization. It is not an easy task to achieve. First of all, to achieve policy clarity. And so there were many committees which were appointed in order to articulate ideas at a conceptual level and then uh, systematically followed up in order to convert it into legislation. And also adopting the tripartite method of the recommended by the ILO. The Indian Labor Conference has been as an important forum through which these uh, tasks were achieved. It's only recently that the Indian Labor Conference is on the verge of collapse. Uh, but even then, uh, I, I, I don't think we can say tripartitism is, uh, is completely uh, killed. Having said that, uh, you know, in relation to the four labor codes, uh, yeah, we recognize the expression labor code, but that is in a sense a misnomer in the current context. Because if you think of labor code, or if you think of codes uh, in, in law, it means a process by which you are trying to put together a whole lot of laws in relation to a particular sector. So it's, it is a comprehensive method of enacting legislation. And, you know, we go back to the Napoleonic Code. In our own country, we think of the Indian Penal Code. It's considered to be the most exhaustive piece of legislation so far as crime is concerned. Or the Criminal Procedure Code or the Civil Procedure Code. I'm afraid none of the four labor codes have that dimension. So in that sense, the use of the word code itself is quite a misnomer. And I'll try and demonstrate that, especially with a reference to the code in relation to wages. Initially, there was the pretension that it is meant for universalization. And now I think that pretension has been given up. And what does that reflect? Why did that pretension arise and why has it been given up? Certainly, it's because of the realization that uh, you can't bluff people that we are going to universalize when you realize that universalization is far from what is sought to be achieved. Uh, it is the intention has been populist and that populist intention, I don't think has a long life because by the time people come to understand, by the time we uh, demystify these codes, there's very little left for popular appeal and certainly the biggest divide there is going to be the way in which the unorganized sector is denied everything. <laughs> the pretension has been that it's going to be covered but that is not at all so. I think even more important is that when you reduce a large number of laws into one so-called code, you're going to open up a Pandora's box of litigation because uh, you know when you put together a large number of definitions which belong to different statutes, then uh, there is internal contradiction. 
And if you want to resolve those internal contradictions, you have to go back to the judiciary. I want to give you one example. The word industry under the Industrial Disputes Act was in dispute from the time the law came into being, 1947, till 1978. And it used to be mentioned that if you plot the Supreme Court judgments relating to the word industry against a graph, you'll get a zigzag curve. So that is the history of litigation in relation to a word. And many of these are jurisdictional definitions. That means uh, whether the law applies or not depends upon what's the meaning you attach to a word. And if you put together a plethora of definitions, it's just uh, opening up the Pandora's box. In the case of industry, it took uh, Justice Krishnayer to sort out the battle. And in 1978, he gave a judgment and simplified it to such an extent that nobody is able to overrule the simplification that he resorted to. So it's not necessary to complicate things through such uh, definitional processes. Now, uh, using that as background, let me say that when you're looking at the code on wages, wage determination in India is done in multiple ways. That's the history of wage determination and that is true even today. Above all, the most important ways in which wage determination has occurred in India, of course by the organized sector, has been collective bargaining. I don't think anybody has a list of how many agreements have been signed between workers and management in India. Thousands and thousands of bilateral and multilateral settlements have been signed. So collective bargaining has been a chief method. When collective bargaining has failed, when there has been a strike, then the government has had the power to refer that to adjudication. And it is through these adjudicative processes that matters have gone up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has laid down very many excellent jurisprudential ideas in order to fit into a developmental framework of the Indian state. And that's quite advanced and that is, you know, pretension that, you know, that doesn't exist is happening when this code uh, has been written. For example, there are two principles which are outstanding in wage determination. One is the capacity to pay and the other is uh, the region come industry test. This is the product of Supreme Court uh, pronouncements and they are valid and relevant even today. That's completely ignored in this uh, wage code. The third is a method of arbitration which uh, Gandhiji introduced, not many of us like it, yet it is a method which has been uh, in existence in the cement industry that's been the only method by which wage determination has happened in India. The fourth is by wage boards and even that's a prevalent thing. Working journalists have always had their wages determined through wage boards and this statute making process, the code making process is quite ignorant of it as we'll see when you then comes the last method and that is for minimum fixation of minimum wages for sweated industry. And here again what this code does is it distinguishes um, wage fixation within the sweated industry into two categories. And there is a whole lot of confusion in relation to that to which I'll come in a moment. But suffice uh, to say you cannot talk of a code and yet leave out so many methods of wage determination. So the word code is most inappropriate and uh, God knows what's the reason why uh, that has been uh, invoked. The uh, Minimum Wage Act is in 1948 and it was meant primarily for sweated labor. And this means that the segments of the unorganized sector were incrementally covered by the Minimum Wage Act. That's been the mechanism, that's the design. Government has the power to notify that a particular sector is now covered by the Minimum Wage Act. And that's what we call as scheduled employment. And there are almost 2,000 scheduled employments in India. And that is the major intervention of the state under the Minimum Wages Act. This legislation seeks to do away with scheduled employment. And so at the outset, I want to point out that within the minimum wage determination mechanism, what the code does is it eliminates wage determination through scheduled employments, nearly 2000 in the country. So that whole section has disappeared from the code. And in its place, it uh, brings in 
what initially was called the national minimum wage in the previous drafts that was ex explicitly introduced the the expression national minimum wage and when the matter went to the uh, uh, to the parliamentary committee the biggest controversy in the parliamentary committee was what do you mean by this national minimum wage there was continuous discussion about it and there was question are you going to have one national minimum wage for the whole country how will you do it there are those states in india which are economically backward and those that are advanced are you planning to introduce a national minimum wage for everybody there is no very clear cut answer about it and it is for this reason and the lack of clarity in relation to the idea of a national minimum wage that the expression national minimum wage has been dropped in the three in the latest uh, it's no longer draft it's become law so that's interesting the biggest controversy which came up before the parliamentary committee is simply dropped and of course in order to uh, tackle that the labor ministry appointed an expert committee and the expert committee went into this question and the expert committee obviously could not answer all the complications related to uh, the creation of a national minimum wage i suppose all of us understand that if you actually notify a national minimum wage in india then nobody can work there can be no wage employment in india below that national <coughs> wage level the expert committee finds it difficult and so they drop the expression nan national minimum wage and this now say floor wage so floor wage is a is a new uh, language which has been brought in if you still analyze the court thank and, and that is because of the lack of clarity in the process of drafting you find there are two methods that is being referred to one method is the continuation of what ought to follow from the method of having scheduled employments and therefore all those sections which are necessary if at all there were scheduled employments that is retained and what is that for a scheduled employment the old law said you have two ways of going about it one is called a committee method that you appoint a committee and the committee recommends what should be the minimum wage for a particular sector the other is called a notification method the government notifies something on the condition that if it is the second method of notification it must go back to an expert committee take their opinion and then only finalize that so interestingly this method is retained and that's the method by which maximum amount of minimum wage notifications happened at the state level the expression in the legislation is appropriate government and the appropriate government in the majority of cases is the state government of course there is similar opportunity for the central government so that method is retained i would therefore a canvas for the position that you now introduce two types of minimum wage through the new proposed code one is minimum wage of the old type for the uh, for the scheduled employment and your confusion is so high that you've dropped scheduled employment and the other is the floor wage method and so that's going to be a wage which will be applicable for all and that wage is going to be determined by the central government and when in the parliamentary committee there's questions about it then they begin to say all right we will also consult the state government but consult in a manner which is going to be prescribed even that is reluctant so the notion is that you know the government of india would like to notify a wage for the whole country that however will not be a national minimum wage it will now be a floor wage expert committee pointed out perhaps there is going to be difficulty so why not have regional uh, floor level wages and that idea has also not been accepted nor rejected but the language enables uh, a kind of floor wage to be fixed even at a state level so in other words the plurality of economic development is uh, is recognized what did the uh, expert committee do the expert committee went into an attempt to calculate what should be the floor level and if you index it if you neutralize it for price rise as of date it comes to approximately 375 rupees the labor minister on the day on which this uh, law became uh, you know final he declared that the floor level will be 178 rupees their own expert committee says 375 at the same time there is the rangarajan committee which was concerned with uh, uh, you know trying to fix what should be the poverty line wage 
and that calculation if you neutralize that also comes to 375 rupees so i am tentatively of the opinion that we should welcome the floor level wage subject to the condition that it cannot be less than what their own expert committee has uh, has recommended so then in other words in other words we should have two types of minimum wages one the floor level wage nobody should get below that there are states in india including pondicherry and many states in the northeast where the equivalent of the floor wage is about 50 rupees so in that context i think it's interesting to examine that proposition coupled with another proposition that you must bring back scheduled employments the uh, government sees the problem and therefore it goes to the extent of saying even if there is a floor level wage that floor level cannot bring down the minimum wage notified in a state so there is a pretension to protect existing minimum wage but that protection is done in a manner in which it will amount to a wage freeze for the future in the scheduled employments and so that's a question which remains unanswered interestingly the committee uh, parliamentary committee took note of it and pointed out explicitly that uh, if uh, you're going to do that their capacity to uh, to revise those uh, minimum wages in the scheduled employment must continue Thank <laughs> you.